How does the Lord play a love song on our hearts? By starting out and pressing upon us that he loves us. We cannot generate love. We can only respond to it. Love is part of the essential nature of God. And agape love, high love, true love, divine love, can only be received and responded to. We cannot create it. So we're going to go to that little Sunday school chorus again, three flats, I think. Dear Sister Ruth, yes, Jesus loves me. Whether you feel like it this early in the morning or not, whether the breakfast impressed it upon you or not, we are loved because he says so. Now, if there's anyone here that feels that you are worth God's love, I need to talk to you after the service. Because the rest of us don't feel that. I've never been able to figure out why God would love me, choose me, call me, involve himself with me, invest himself in me. I don't figure it out. As a matter of fact, I used to have a long list of reasons why he should not have. But the Bible says he does. And when I will stop looking at me and look at him, I become aware of that love flowing. Now, when Sis and I had a church together, we brought it into praise. In the grace of God, he led us to do so. And early, perhaps, low-level worship. But I got them to a level in expression of praise and couldn't break them beyond it. Just could not break them beyond it. I did everything I knew. I preached everything I could see in the scriptures. And if any of you have read my book on praise, let us praise. That's the, the story of what happened there. And I was really working, pushing and pulling and trying and striving. And finally, the Lord got through to me. Because if all else fails, ask God. <laughs> and the Lord said, the people are already responding as high as their concept of me is. There's no need working any further on trying to get them to release more. They've got to receive more. They've got to see me at higher levels. So I spent the next year preaching on God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God in heaven, God on earth, God in us, and all of you, everything I could. Didn't do much. And then I had one very glorious service. Finally, I was able to put the pressure on Bob Mumford to come. He and I had been preaching conferences and camp meetings together. I, the one, he, the evenings. And I was trying to get him to come. He said, you don't need me, man. You and I stand shoulder to shoulder preaching in these camp meetings. Why should I come to your church? Of course, during all that time, I was telling him what a great church we had, blah, 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 blah. So he finally came. Biggest crowd we'd ever had in the building. Just hopeless. Had the fire marshal showing up. He'd have closed everything down. And I had bragged to Bob that... Uh, our morning solace, who is my sister's secretary now, reached out and got something fresh from God for every Sunday morning. Sometimes she went through the old literature and came up with a hymn that we hadn't ever heard. Sometimes she reached into the very latest. Sometimes the Lord would give her something brand new. But she gave herself all week long to prayer and looking to come up with that one song that would touch us on Sunday morning. And we really blessed her and received from her. So on this Thursday night, of course, I had her scheduled. <clears throat> when it came to about that time on the program, for we never introduced anyone. They just stepped up and did. I nudged Bob. I said, this is the one I've been telling you about. Now, she'll just bless you right out of your socks. <clears throat> My wife was her pianist. Came to the piano, and Sister Shirley Green got up and <clears throat> fussed and got everything all lined out and gave my wife the nod. And my wife began to give an introduction that I knew was wrong. My wife gets nervous in front of large groups, functions beautifully in small groups, but in large groups gets very nervous. And I knew that what had happened is that in walking down to the piano and looking back and seeing 800 plus people, she got nervous and was playing the wrong page. So I tried to help her by snapping my fingers at her. The other page. And my wife is absolutely, totally submitted to me in anything she wants to do. And she wanted to ignore me, so she did. And to my consternation, Sister Shirley Green, in the largest crowd I'd had together at that time, with the greatest man I had ever met, began to sing, Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And I began to resist it. 
of all the low-level Sunday school choruses to be sung before such an august gathering as this. And then it dawned on me, oh, she's clever. She is clever. I've seen her do this before. She's going to swing us into something heavy, maybe a Beethoven, a Bach. And she's going to lightly get us with her. Ah, I was proud of her. And then she, Jesus loves me, this I know. And I just begin to scooch down in my seat. Second verse. Third verse. That was it. Except she kept singing the chorus over and over and over and over and over. I started out with righteous indignation and I ended up mad. <laughs> so I turned to Bob Mumford to apologize and saw tears streaming down his cheeks. The Lord says, why don't you look at your congregation? And I looked out there and I saw people crying that I had never seen respond to God in anything. Tears just streaming as they were singing with her, yes, Jesus loves me. All my year of preaching hadn't reached them. But something of the simplicity of the song got through to them. And they were appropriating it. And finally, when Sister Shirley Green got through, she turned to me before she left the platform. She says, I'm sorry. I know I have violated your desires. But I've got to obey my boss, too. I walked off. <clears throat> Yes, Jesus loves me. Elementary? Of course it is. That's where the whole gospel starts. Let's sing it. E, e, e flat. Chorus. The, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Now that's uh, the right key, but could we put it down to a morning key? Thank you. <laughs> Ye oh, you yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. All right, now you're verbalizing it beautifully. And I cannot speak for you, but I'm a man that cannot really communicate with words only. Having to write is the biggest chore of my life. When the Lord called me to it and began to press me and the story is too long, but I mean I've really been pressed to be a writer. It has been pain and pressure and tears and signs. My first book, I had to write it five times before it was even good enough they could send it to a rewrite before they could publish it. You know what's wrong? I depend upon gestures, inflections, raised eyebrows, pauses. I can't even answer the phone without body language. <clears throat> Tie my hands behind my back, and I'm no good. Even when I'm on the radio, I'm doing all kinds of gestures, and the engineer thinks I'm trying to say up, down, everything. I have to warn, hey, don't pay any attention to me. I'm just talking. But you know, you transcribe one of my tapes and read it, it's devastating. It's shocking what I don't say on those tapes. But the tone of voice says it. The pause sets it up, or... The gesture does it. Now, I'm going to ask you, would it be possible for us to sing this and use more than verbal language? Could we use a little bit of body language? Would you dare just let your whole being express however you want? And I don't know if you call it gestures, fine. I'm just thinking in terms of body language. Uh, closing the eyes isn't the total thing. Let's really let our body express, yes, Jesus loves me. I've lost the pitch in all of my talking. Where are we? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
the Bible tells me so. And of course, the proper response when somebody says, I love you, if it's honest, is I love you. Now, don't lie about it. You, if you can't honestly say, so, well, I like you, or at least I receive it, or if you can't do that, say, I reject that. But some response is proper. So why don't we make a response back to the one who is saying, I love you, and let's sing, yes, I love Jesus. I'm glad to tell him so. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. I'm glad to tell him so. Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. I'm glad to tell him so. Well, I reckon you really are and would, but where is he? Where is Jesus? In your heart? Now, that's, if that's true, that's very confusing to me, for I was always taught it was in my heart. You know, we sometimes get such high concepts that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavens, which is theologically accurate. But it is also theologically accurate, Christ in you, the hope of glory, see? And without taking away from the higher, let's realize that if man could have ascribed to the higher, Christ would never have become the lower. We were never able to reach up to God on the throne, so God on the throne got off and came down to man on earth. And we can respond to the God-man. Do you know there still is a God-man? God in man, that plural group becomes the God man. We're the body of Christ. So one more step, and then I'm going to start preaching. I think we do well to turn to one another. Let's pair off in ones, twos. Husbands and wife, if you're together, of course, at the camp, sometimes they take total vacations, wife's in the back and husband's in the front. I want you to hold hands and look each other in the eye. <clears throat> well, some of you have improved on that. I like your way better. And I want you to sing, I love Jesus in you. I'm glad to tell you so. Where's my pitch, Ruth? I love Jesus in you. I love Jesus in you. I love Jesus in you. I'm glad to tell you so. All right, let's trade partners after you get through with that long hug. Yeah, I like this camp. Some camps you just get one quick squeeze, but here you get a real hug. Let's do it one more time. Are you understanding what I'm trying to show you? Husbands, you'd be amazed what it would do to your love life if you could recognize Christ lives in your wife. Wives... It would really help you relate to the beast if you realize Christ lives in him. When you can't love him for what he is, at least you can love who is in him. I love Jesus in you. Okay, got yourself a partner? Let's sing it. I love Jesus in you. I love Jesus in you. I love Jesus in you, I'm glad to tell you so. I love Jesus in you, dear ones. Bless you. <coughs> All right, you may be seated for the next 67 minutes. Let's turn once more. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Get my stopwatch out here. Don't know why I bother with it. It's never stopped me yet. About only
only two things that really stopped me. <clears throat> the taking of an offering or the lifting of our voices in praise. So if I'm really going over time, either start passing the plates or start lifting your hands in praise to the Lord. All right, verse 11 we completed finally after spending a couple of days trying. Hezekiah has the heads of the Levite families and the Aaronic priesthood together, challenging them to accept God's choosings. Verses 12, 13, and 14 give us the names of the heads of these families. My reading it to you would only pr uh, prove to you that I can pronounce Hebrew. Wouldn't edify anyone. These names mean something to them, but don't mean a thing to us. So let's start at verse 15. <clears throat> and these guys, whoever they are, these guys gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kedron. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Then they went in to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz and his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Step number one in bringing and coming from a false worship of a true God to a true worship of a true God is a change in the king. Step number two is the priests accepting God's choosings. Step number three, now that the king has said, we will worship, and the priests have said, we will lead worship, step number three is to clean the temple. For no edict of the king nor preparation of the priesthood can yet bring worship to bear because God cannot be worshipped in a dirty temple. God cannot and will not have communion with a defiled saint, but he can and he will cleanse him. Now before I go any further, I want you to be comfortable with me, number one, that while the scripture speaks of temple, and this was temple, my mind immediately goes back to the original pattern, the tabernacle. I have problems with the temple. To me, the temple is man's attempt to improve on God's provision. Man enlarged it, made permanent what God made small and temporary. So although the pattern is the same, I prefer the original pattern. And I'll be thinking in terms of tabernacle. Number two. I want you to remember that the New Testament teaches us in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and other places, ye are the temple of God. What? No, you're not. You're the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. We are an holy habitation of God being built up together. So in my application, I will not be thinking of the buildings or the denomination or the codes. I'm thinking of the people. And while I know that I, Judson, am not a temple of God, but I, you, we, he, they, she, collective form the temple. I also know that I, as an individual, am the place where God dwells. A very small amount of God, that's the beauty of getting together like this with others who have a small amount of God. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. It's beginning to make sense when more of us get together because I have such a small deposit of God but you have a little deposit, and when somehow we can kind of get meshed together, we begin to sense what the picture's all about. But even though what I have is a small deposit, I, almost like a miniature temple, I, I do think that I have a right to make the application this way. For I am not aware that we have that many pastors on the ground. This is not a pastor's convention. I spent a lot of time in them, and as I shared with Iverna, one of my big problems is no matter where I read in the Bible, I always think in terms of pastors, preachers. And so when I stand up to preach, I have to wait and say, wait a minute, now this is not a group of leaders. It's because my specific call is to leaders. Everywhere I go, anytime I minister outside of this country, I minister to pastors, 
and missionaries only. I don't go to any churches. I have a mental concept that I don't have much to offer to any church of another culture, but that I can offer it to the pastors, and they in turn can run it through their own culture, come out their language, and it will fit that group. You, you'd just be amazed if you'd be honest with yourself how much of our teaching is integrated with our culture. Let me give you one quick illustration. Ministering in Indonesia, a very sharp interpreter, really knew the English language well. I took as my text, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And he turned to me and said, what snow? I said, well, you, you, you don't know what snow is? Well, we've never, there's never been snow in Indonesia in the history of the world. Well, I said, snow is, uh, <clears throat> well, it's kind of like shaved ice. He said, what's ice? I said, you don't know what ice is? He says, I know because I've been in the city. These preachers have never seen ice. I said, well, it's, it's water that's gotten so cold it's gotten hard. He said, what's cold? I said, I feel that of the Lord to take another text. <clears throat> and I did. All right. Until the temple is cleansed, there cannot be worship. Even though the king says, we will, and the priest says, we're ready. The temple has to be cleansed. You and I need to be clean. Hear the word of the Lord, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. If the vessels of the Lord, the place of worship, the place of contact, communication, and communion with God is within us, we must be clean. Now let's think for a moment or two about why this place is dirty. It's been locked up for a big part of Ahaz's reign. I'm in no position to say how long it was, but the potential is that it could have been locked up as much as 20 consecutive years. It would at least be in its teens. Remember that when Solomon built the temple, he built his own house right next to it, and they had a covered portico between the two. Now, when Ahaz locked the gates to this great temple, the house of the Lord, that left him a great big spare room. What happens to a spare room? Every once in a while, I'm picked up at the airport and the director of the pastor will say, I'm awfully sorry, but there's a convention in town. No motels are available. We're going to have to put you in a private home. Uh, but don't worry about it. These folks have a lovely private room. Downstairs, you'll have the whole area to yourself. I said, it's a guest room? They said, yes. I said, then I can tell you two things about it. Number one, there will be no place to hang anything. The closets will be full. Number two, even if they have four bureaus, there will not be one drawer I can put my underwear in. I'm going to live out of a suitcase while I'm here. And it's almost always right. Even if it's down in the basement, away from the rest of the house, it's a guest room that's never used. Everything that is not good enough to be used in the rest of the house, but too good to be thrown away, goes to the guest room. How many of you have a two-car garage and yet you keep your one car out on the front? Of course. We all have this problem. What is not being used becomes storage area, right? May I project the potential that since human nature hasn't changed since God made Adam, that probably everything from the palace that got replaced, and remember Ahaz did some rather wide traveling, wide for his day, and he was forever suing for peace, and he would go as an emissary. He was one of the very first Kissingers in history. He was always going to some other country to try to get peace and ended up with pieces. I imagine he brought back all types of memorabilia, he had all kinds of souvenirs, and that meant something had to go. I just dare to believe it kept getting stacked in this great big locked-up outer court until it was just heaped with unusable things. Unfortunately, they didn't have a St. Vincent de Paul or Salvation Army, so they just stuck it over there. Now, if you will allow me to remind you that the temple and tabernacle had three courts. There was an outer court where people came for worship, and it was surrounded with a wall, fence. Then there was the inner court, the holy place, where the priests could go 
for worship and fellowship. There were three pieces of furniture in here. Then there was the Holy of Holies that was God's place. It's the only place there was a chair in the whole temple or tabernacle because in anything that's religious, there is no rest. The only thing religion ever does is W-R-E-S-T, but never R-E-S-T. Only God had a seat because God's work was always done. It is finished. We are told that we are a three-court person. We are spirit, soul, body. We always call ourselves body, soul, spirit because that's the way we relate. But God always in the Bible calls us spirit, soul, body because he first of all relates to the Holy of Holies and then infuses the holy place and makes contact with life through us in our outer court. Will you allow me, and I'm being very arbitrary, to suggest that the outer court probably refers and at least illustrates our body-soul complex. Because it's in this body-soul area, the physical, the emotional, and the mental. The soul is the mental and the emotional nature. It's where we have our feelings and store our facts. The body is quite obvious. For some of you, it's so much nicer than the rest of us. It's in this body-soul area that we have relationship to people. That's what the outer court was for, so God could have a relationship with people and people could have a relationship with God. It's here in this outer court that the manifestations of the inner court are given. Here's where all the manifestations of the desires of my heart are seen, either in my emotions, my words, or my actions. This is where the deeds are done. It's here in this outer court that my activities and my works are performed. Most people only know you by your outer court. One of the joys of coming to a camp such as this, particularly for those of you who have developed a walk in the Spirit, one of the joys is to be able to know a person a little bit from his Holy of Holies, his Spirit. Haven't we noticed, and it's been evident with me perhaps more because I have never seen you before, and I think God's going to answer your prayers. You'll never see me again. But uh, who knows? <clears throat> Not down here. But I've had the joy of being able to know some of you, though I have never seen you. Know something about you, at least know this much, that we are related. That the same spirit that's in me is in you. To be able to sense that your motivations are pure before God. That we can interact together on a pure, true spirit level. But for the most part, we know each other by the body, or we know each other by the mental, or by the emotional. Okay all that background, let me say that the priests began to clean up the temple, and they started by cleaning up the outer court, and then they cleaned up the inner court. And interestingly enough, there is a division in the priesthood, you know that, I have alluded to it, there is the Aaronic priest, the high priest, only they could minister in the holy place. Now that's an overstatement, because there are examples in the scripture where they did join in that ministry when there was a shortage in the Aaronic priesthood. Remember, the Aaronic priesthood started out with Aaron and three sons. And the very first day of service, God killed two of the sons. So that didn't leave too big a priesthood. And those two sons are already to improve and come up with their own fire. And God says, no way, you use my fire. So he zapped them with his fire and that left two priests. So they had to have help. But when that multiplied a little bit, the Aaronic priesthood took their position of authority. I've recently been told by somebody who spends their whole life in Israel, and they're constantly delving into the background, that they are unable, the Hebrew people are unable to find one remaining member of the Aaronic priesthood. If that be true, then all the teaching that we have heard in years gone by, or that I have heard, I don't know if you've heard it, that there must be a reestablishment of the temple and temple worship before Christ can come, uh, it, it's just a little bit weak, isn't it? Because if they don't have a priest, why have a temple? But that's not my lesson, so I won't say it. There was a division between the priesthood. Basically, 
the Levites ministered in the outer court and the Aaronic priesthood ministered in the holy place. Now I say basically because there was interaction. The Aaronic priest could minister in the outer court and sometimes did. Levites could and sometimes did. But the basic division was the Levites were mostly servants to the priests. And yet God called them priests and they functioned as priests. But because there was a prohibition of their entering into the holy place, except on certain occasions that God has allowed them to be sanctified, they could only clean the outer court. But the Aaronic priesthood jumped in to help them. The higher stepped down to assist the lower, and all of them jumped in to clean this outer court and were able to report that they did it in seven days. The accumulated debris of 17 to 20 years was cleaned up in seven days. They had a mind to work. They jumped in and they did it. May I point out a few things that are quite obvious. Number one is that they came together, according to verse 15, by the commandment of the king, by the words of the Lord, to cleanse the house of the Lord. Do you see with me that we have a beautiful harmony between the king, the prophet, and the priest? The king decreed it. The prophets backed it up and said, this is the word of the Lord. Probably it was the prophet Isaiah. He was current in that day, was the tutor of Hezekiah. And then the priest said, we'll do it. Oh, wouldn't it be beautiful if once again we could come back to where the diverse multiple ministries complete one another instead of compete with one another. The king could not do it by himself. The priests could not do it by themselves. And the prophet could not do it by himself. But the three main realms of God's leadership of his people in the Old Testament harmonized, heard one word from the Lord, blended their spirit together and said, we'll do it. The king addicted it. The prophets prophesied and urged them, and the priest got in and did the job. But I must move on because that is a lesson in its own, but oh, we have so much to learn about complementing one another instead of competing with one another. Have you, let me just illustrate it. Have you been in a service, as I have, where there comes a clear word of prophecy. It's just a burning, sweet word from the Lord. And almost the same message is given five more times. You wondered why? It's Me Too-ism. Everyone wants you to know, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can actually improve on that. Well, it may not be in the conscious mind. Usually we're pretty well in control in the conscious mind, but subconsciously there's a sense, hey, Sarah got all the attention. I want these people to know I've got the same anointing she's got. And so we stand up and give the same prophetic utterance. And it's not all that great. I've been in conferences where I was the morning speaker. The evening speaker sat and took notes on everything I taught and then stood in the evening session and took me apart by name. This morning Cornwall said, but I want you to know the Word of God says. This morning Cornwall suggested, but I want you to know that the Bible says. This morning Cornwall said he did, and I want you to know what the Bible says. It's a fun two weeks. Believe me, I no longer schedule two-week sessions. <clears throat> of course we have differences of views and differences of ministries and there are differences of administration of the spirit through us but that doesn't mean we are to be competing with one another we're to complete with complete one another's ministry and if i am with a team of ministries in a convention and something is being preached that is contrary to the way i see it i refuse to use my turn in preaching to further confuse the people but I will take the brother out for a bite to eat and say, hey, you're seeing things differently than I see them. Could you share with me how you came to this position? And then having let him tell what he sees, that means he should let me tell how I see. And sometimes I find he's right. Huh? 
And there are other times we find that there is no way we can genuinely reconcile our views. He comes from one heritage, I come from another. How many of you have learned that the anointing doesn't really change our attitude toward what we've been taught? People with the same anointing I have sprinkle. And I have the same anointing and I dunk. And I just had to stop trying to correct them. I wished, really, I wish they could convince me that dry clean operation is right. It's so much less messy. <laughs> okay. A second thing I want you to see here is that the priest cleaned the temple. They didn't ask God to. They did not join hands, form a circle around the outer court walls, and say to the prophet, Now prophesy unto the Lord. King, lead us in prayer. And then the priests all chant heaven, O oh God, thou who sittest upon the circle of the earth, exalted in the heavens above all, this is thy house. We have consecrated it to thee. We have dedicated it to thee. We have built it unto thy name, and it is defiled. And so we ask thee to send a fireball from heaven and a mighty rushing wind to cleanse the filth the king Ahaz has brought into it. And we stand here in faith, expecting thee to do it. Hasn't it been sad in the past few years how we stand in line to have some authoritative person try to cast out what we dragged in? Say, now come on, Cardinal, don't you believe a Christian can have a demon? I believe a Christian can have anything he wants. But I think it's well overdue for us to accept the responsibilities to cleanse our own lives. The priest did not ask God to clean up the place. They went in and cleaned up the place. This is not that God would be inactive. God supplies the buckets, the mops, the sponges, and the Mr. Clean. But the muscle work has to be done by us. It is our temple, you know. It's our temple. No, oh, no, I've given it to God. That's all right, but it's still yours. A whole New Testament calls your body your temple. But it does say it also becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. When Sis and I were pastoring together <clears throat> at one of our services, a sister stood to her feet. We were taking some prayer requests. She said, I just want to give a real praise testimony to the Lord. Oh, I've learned so much in the short time I have been here. She said, this morning in your prayer meeting, I just totally gave my son over to the Lord. It's been the greatest release of my whole experience. You see, my son is, a, is very unruly, out of control, estreporous. I cannot control my son. And I've just totally given him the hand of the Lord. I have such peace and such joy, and I just want to thank the Lord. And I just want you folks now to join me that God will bring my son into great victory. And something didn't ring right in my spirit. I said, excuse me, sister, I've been away for a few weeks in ministry. I don't believe I've ever met you. Uh, how old is your son? Oh, he's three years going on four. I said, I have some bad news for you. God won't take three-year-olds. The Bible says for you to train up the child in the way that he should go. Now, if he were 33, I can see the Lord perhaps letting you out from under some responsibility. If you could prove to him, you train him up in the way he should go. I said, sister, this is a cop-out, and we will not accept it in this church. To the best of my knowledge, he did not return, but my people learned a lesson. What a nasty cop-out. I just give it to God, now you raise him. God said, oh, no, you brought him into this world, now you raise him. I will strengthen you, I will illuminate you, I will give guidance to you, but you raise the brat, I mean the child. <laughs> now you can identify with that, because most of us are, uh, well not most of, many of us are grandparents, and many of you have your children beautifully in hand. Well, if these are your kids who are on the ground, they're beautifully in hand. I am proud of the young people and the children on this grounds. It is tremendous. You're great. You're absolutely great. 
I don't know anything about your personal lives, but I do know that you have been very great to me as a speaker, and you've made it easy for me. And you've shown attention and consideration, and uh, so far nobody's hit me with a spit water. I think this is a great camp. <laughs> if your temple is going to be cleaned, don't stand back and send orders to heaven for angels to come with mops and pails. You get hold of the word of God, which is the labor, and you start cleaning up. And if the dirt is too big for the labor, try some of the blood of Jesus Christ. But you start applying. It's overdue for us to start applying the provisions of God's word to the problems in our life. And if you won't apply it, it's not going to get applied. Clean up that outer temple. Clean up your act. Clean up the way people see you. Clean up the way you function in front of people. Clean up your activities. Clean up your works. Clean up your manifestations. Clean up your deeds. So it just doesn't matter to anybody. I'm my own person, and I don't want to be brought back under law and legalism, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And you might just keep people from ever finding the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you heard the illustration? It is true. Mahatmas K. Gandhi. Remember him? Just as old timers remember him. Most powerful leader that India ever had. In such control, he wrested it from the hands of the British Empire and could have taken it any way he wanted to take it. When Mahatmas K. Gandhi was a young man in South Africa studying law, he went to one of the spirit-filled Pentecostal churches in his search for reality. The minister preached on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and Mahatma's case sat there with tears streaming down his face, stirred and moved. And when the pastor made the invitation, he started to get up, but the man sitting next to him was all wrapped up in reading the Sunday school paper, had paid no attention whatsoever, and didn't even recognize that Mr. Gandhi wanted to go to the altar and Gandhi took one look at that and said, oh, am I ever a fool? That preacher caught me with his abilities to speak. If it were real, this man would be moved too. And that was the last identification with Christianity Gandhi had. What could have happened to India if that man could have just put his hand on his... Mahatma's K and said, would you like me to go with you? Or if Mr. Gandhi had even sensed reality in the people, but he didn't. The outer manifestation of this man kept a key leader from meeting Christ. Don't say you're your own person, you're going to do your own thing. There's no such thing as being your own person. We affect people everywhere we go. Tones, attitudes, actions affect people. They manifest our attitude toward Christ. And I think it's overdue for the Christians to learn to clean up their act. Well, I'm not going to let somebody else's conscience dictate what I can do. Oh, maybe you better. Paul said that if he was with a group of people that eating meat was offensive, he'd become a vegetarian. Paul don't you have liberty to eat meat? He said, I have liberty to eat anything that I offer thanks for. But I don't have the liberty to violate another man's conscience. Hmm? Too heavy? They cleaned up the outer court. Then they begin to work on the inner court. And this, to me, is most unique. Because quite frankly, saints, it does not do us that much good to clean up the outer court if we're not willing to clean up the inner court. What's on the inside is going to eventually show up on the outside. But when it came to the cleansing of the inner court, which area I would speak of as being man's spirit, that place where we have relationship to God and God consciousness, we sing a lot about him being the savior of our soul, but he is a re resident in our spirit, not in our soul. God does not communicate with man's spirit, he uh, with man's soul, he communicates with man's spirit. It's not brain calling to brain, but spirit calling to spirit. That's why we have difficulty with God's communication. We are not that familiar with spirit communication. And until we can get it from the spirit down into the soul, we don't really know what was said. Not infrequently at all. Have I had 
leaders come to me and say, oh, thank God for that message this morning. Brother Cornell, I have felt this for months, but I've never been able to put it in words. Now that you've put it in words, I can teach it. Do you know why I was able to put it in words and they couldn't? Because a special gift of God, I'm a teacher. And God forces me to put everything he says into words almost instantly. While God is dealing with me, he forces me to grab it and push it down from the spirit to my soul so I can get it put in vocabulary form. I usually say it out loud right then. Otherwise, I'll never be able to teach it. Have you been in groups where the individual speaking says, oh, oh God has really been sharing with me. I'll tell you something. I've never, ever felt and sensed and learned from God what I've learned. You know, it, it's just, I just can't quite put it into words, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. You know how it is. And they spend 30 minutes talking about, you know, uh-huh, mm, oh, it's tremendous. And they never say anything. And yet, you know, they are honest. They've received something from God. They sense it. They feel it. Faith is flowing, but they can't express because they haven't learned how to get it from the spirit to the soul so it can be communicated. All right, that's another lesson. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they don't have any of my books here. I would like to have told you that that is chapter 5 of Let Us Abide. But since the books aren't here, I won't mention them. <clears throat> the priests, the Aaronic priests, were the only ones that could go into the holy place. And they went in to clean up. Now what would be dirty in here? Well, number one, we're told that Ahaz did some stripping of the gold in order to bribe off the enemy. The only gold in the tabernacle was in the inner parts. In the outer part, it was all brass. So he's come in here and ripped gold off the walls. Any of you that have done any moving of partitions know what a mess it creates when you start ripping things around. If this is not true, because with me that's conjecture, I cannot give you chapter and verse. Just the fact that it had not been used for 17 to 20 years would be bad enough. My wife travels with me quite a lot in the ministry, about 60% of the time, and it's not too unusual for us to lock up the house and be gone for two consecutive months before we get back home, make a big long tour. And before we leave, you better believe she has that house in spotless order. But the moment we come back and get off the plane, we're still waiting for our luggage. You know what the first words out of our mouth are? Oh, the house is going to be filthy. Going to be filthy. And being a man, my expression is, how can it be filthy? Nobody's been in it for two months. She said, that's why it's dirty. She's right. Open the door, dust everywhere. It's not messy. It's dirty. And I can't help but think that the holy place, the inner court, was dirty even if nothing had been torn up, just because it hadn't been used. And do you sense with me that when our inner court, our spirit, is not used, it gets dirty? When we do not worship, filth creeps in. The inactivity creates defilement. If all of our activity is in the outer court, the inner court is going to get dirty. The priests alone could cleanse this. But oh, I love the order here. The priests picked up what had to be removed, carried it through the doorway, the hanging. Jesus Christ was the three hangings of the tabernacle. You know, I am the way, I am the truth. I'm the life. So they took it out through the door of the truth to the outer court, which is now clean. And the minute they put it in the outer court, the outer court is now dirty. And the Levites picked it up and took it clear out of the city to the valley of Kidron, which was a burial place, and didn't even put it in the valley. They put it in the river Kidron, the brook, that flowed down into the Dead Sea. Do you see the cooperation? The priest brought it from the inner to the outer. The Levites carried it from the outer to a place of burial. Now, sometimes we ask people to come into our holy place to clean us up. And they have no right in your holy place. I have no entree to your spirit. I have no right 
into your spirit. No husband has a right into the spirit of his wife. No wife has a right into the spirit of her husband. That spirit belongs to God. That is strictly you and God. Don't let other people in there. But it's got to get cleaned up. Let me give a very crazy illustration, but sometimes the sillier they are, the longer we remember them. Let's say that I come into my holy place. I'm going to worship. I stop, <clears throat> refurbish the lamp so I have light to do it. You know, it's hard to worship without the light of the Spirit. Step over here to the table of showbread, perhaps have a bite of refreshment of Christ to have strength. And now I step up with a handful of incense and I throw it upon the coals. Maybe I've even brought fresh coals on the golden altar. And I lift my hands and I begin to say, oh, Lord, I worship you. And I hear, bah, bah. And I look over my shoulder and here's a goat. Now, there's nothing wrong with goats. They were the sin offerings. The only thing wrong is that the goat belongs in the outer court. Something that belongs to the outer court has crept into the holy place. Ever have that happen? Things from your natural life show up in your spiritual life. Do you ever experience what I do regularly? Hardly do my knees stop creaking as I bend them in prayer until my mind starts thinking of things that must be done. Light bulbs that must be changed, bills that must be paid. Oh my Lord, I promised to write a magazine article for them. Deadline is tomorrow. Oh, my mind gets so overactive. Now an active mind is glorious, but that part of me belongs in the outer court. I'm supposed to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth here. So what do we do? We sublimate it. We push it down. We say, shh, 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 shh. just like I turn to the goat and say, hush, 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 hush. And I lift my hands again. Oh, Lord, I worship you. And the goat says, bah. And I reach back and give him a kick. I worship you, oh, Lord, in spirit. <clears throat> But how many have been around goats enough to know that if you kick him in the head, they'll use that head to kick you elsewhere? And it isn't very long until I'm saying, Oh, Lord, I were. So I take off my belt, slip him around the horns of the goat, and tie him to this golden altar. Now I'm going to worship you, Lord. But even though the goat can no longer butt me, he can sure ba a lot, and he keeps interrupting me so that my mind is drawn from God to goat. So in desperation, I take the belt back, and I drag him over to the walls, and I lift it up, and I push the goat out. And I say, oh, Lord, we're free. Now it's just you and me. Hallelujah. Ah! For that little goat figures that if he can go out that easily, he can come in that easily. Yes, you are identifying. That's great. We all have those problems, don't we? That same thing comes again and again and again. I don't know about you, but my mind recycles on a seven-minute basis. So I have found the best thing to do the moment you hear the first ba is grab the goat by the horns and take him out through the door and say, Levites, is there anyone here who can help me? And turn him over for the Levites to handle so I can come back and deal with God. Now, in a very practical way, the way I actually do it is that I never go to prayer without these two implements, a pen and paper. I open them first. Then maybe I'll open my Bible. And then I begin to pray. And every time one of those outer court goats begins to baa, I write it down. And in the process of writing it down, he's gone. Because any time I write anything down, it's no longer circulating in my memory circuits. Now that's tragic, because if I lose my notebook, no go. But it frees my mind now for the use of the spirit, because you cannot worship God, spirit only, we don't know how. The spirit becomes the motivating force, but we do need our memory circuits and we need our emotions. And these areas cannot be functioning for the body, the outer court thing. They now must be servants of the holy place in order to function to God. And I just defuse myself by writing down what's bothering me. Now, if what's bothering me is sin, 
There's no sense writing sin down. You might just as well walk right out in the outer court and take care of it. Death is the only answer to sin. And that's where the brazen altar was. And you could just take it on out and say, hey, Levites, I need help with this thing. Will you kill it? And after you've killed it and sprinkled the blood, would you have time to take it right on out to the brook and put it in and let it flow down into the Dead Sea? I don't want to ever see this thing again. I want free from it forever. I want it buried where even the fish can't feed on it. I want it gone from my life. Now, I'm not teaching entire sanctification, I don't think. But I am saying, saints, that some of us have wrestled with the same problems for 15 years just because we weren't willing to genuinely bring them to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and have them crucified and then take them out and bury them. Don't put them in urns because we have a tendency to build temples to urns of ashes. Let's get them out there in the Dead Sea where they can't be found again. God would like to deliver us from these things that hinder our relationship to him. Deliver us from them totally. Sis has been handling it nicely in the evenings. God wants us to be a freed people from everything that would hinder our relating to him. If we will not clean up our own life, then he will chasten. And if necessary, punish us until we do clean up our life. But he will not clean up our life for us. Oh, but you say, but the corner looks... It's just too big for me. I need help. Great. Drag it out of the inner to the outer and then ask for help. Don't ask us to come into your inner and help you find it. You bring it on out. Then we'll be happy to join you by laying hands on it, taking it to the cross. We may even drag it out and bury it for you. But we've got to get hold of it. Let me give you a quick illustration. No, it won't be quick. Let me give you an illustration. I'm trying to be honest today. Now, before I give the illustration, may I say I am not trying in any wise to pick out any one thing and put the word sin on it. But I'm trying now to demonstrate, and we need something that's visible. I have a sister in the Lord, very precious to me. I've known her about as long as I've known Sister Lillian, maybe a little longer. She has a sweet ministry in the Lord, and she has a very lovely husband that is supportive to her in ministry. I wouldn't say that he has a ministry, but he's, you know, a good balance for her. But he has one problem, he smokes. I'm not sure that smoke will put anybody in hell. I'm not sure that it's any worse than some of the attitudes that us non-smokers have. So I'm not trying to speak down, but I do think it interesting, just about the time the Church of Jesus Christ got liberal in her attitude towards smoking, the Attorney General got real stern. <clears throat> She's had me pray with her and she has prayed, she has fasted. She has sought the face of God. She has nagged. You name it, anything a woman knows how to do, she has done to get him delivered. And his total answer is, I've smoked since I was 16. I'll just never be able to stop. On a few occasions, as the Spirit of the Lord seems to have been pressing extra heavy, he says, anytime God wants to have this habit, he can take it from me. Okay? About a year ago, he had a lengthy siege of problems with his lungs and got sicker and sicker and they finally took him to the hospital and after preliminary examination the doctor came in and says well that's the end of your smoking you have advanced emphysema and if you don't give up your smoking we'll be burying you before very long this sister got me on the phone, Judson, Judson, it's happened, hallelujah. What, what it seems that God couldn't do in the services, he's done through the doctors. Oh, my husband's scared. This is the end of smoking. I rejoiced with her. But when he got out of the hospital, all he did was change brands. Still smoked. Two months later, she was out in ministry with his permission, got careless with his cigarette, and set the house on fire. In his desperation to save a few things, got very severely burned and spent a lengthy time in the hospital. It was a fair-sized fire. It cost $40,000 to rebuild the house. Wiped them out. Totally wiped them out. The house plus the hospitalization. Had to sell it, get out from under it, live in an apartment. And after the initial weeping was the rejoicing. Well, it was a terrible price to pay. Everything we have was tied up in that house. It's the only thing we have in the whole world. But he'll never smoke another cigarette. But now he only smokes outside. 
So when you go to visit her, he's probably out on the front porch, puffing away. Still saying, whenever God wants that habit, he can have it. You know what my point is. He'll smoke his way into a coffin with that attitude. I happen to believe that the responsibility for the release of anything is the individual's. When he says, I have had it with this, I will not have it anymore, and brings that from his inner motivations to those of us who see its outer manifestation, help will come from the Lord. But standing back resignedly saying, well, whenever God wants to deliver me from cigarettes, from drinking, from lust, from adultery, whenever God wants to deliver me from lying, from deceit, from cheating, from stealing, I'm available. God can do it. You'll do it to your dying day and think it over in hell. But when you come to grips with it, God's word says that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he that defileth this temple, him will God defile, or whatever verse God's dealing with you about your sin. And you say, God, you're right, and get hold of that stupid goat and start dragging out, say, brothers and sisters, pray for me. Then deliverance comes. Then it can go to the cross and die. Then it can be taken from a place of death to burial and be gone forever and ever. And I could give you testimony after testimony of individuals who from one level of sin to another have finally come to grips with it. And the moment they came to grips with it and could drag it, the 15 feet to the door, victory was there. When we say, I can't because I always have, we're saying, I won't because I still like. A man in my congregation a few years ago, a real adultery problem, real lust problem, which produced adultery. His home was at stake. Finally, he seemed to come to grips with it, brought it out, we prayed. God gave him a real deliverance, just a real deliverance. It was beautiful. About six months later, he came to me in my study. He said, Pastor, I'm embarrassed, but I've got to have help in handling this. I am so lonesome. I said, what do you mean you're so lonesome? He said, I've lived my whole life with lust, and now that it's gone, I don't know how to function without it. And I said, Brother, there's only one way to satisfy that craving and that longing. Now you need to learn how to come into love. Every time something is taken out, it leaves a vacancy. Sometimes almost a vacuum, depending on how much you've been, dep been dependent upon it. And God's order is not that we forever live with that pain and that ache. God's order is that now I find satisfaction in Him. And he becomes its replacing. On this matter of smoking, I don't know why I'm hung on it. I cannot speak with any empathy because in the mercy of God, I was saved when I was three, started preaching when I was seven, and God just mercifully kept me from getting caught up in that habit. But I've talked with people who smoke, and I've tried my best to find out what it's all about. Uh, in the first place, it's, of course, a misnomer for anyone to say that I smoke because they don't. The cigarette smokes, they're only the sucker. But I have had so many men tell me, I don't, I don't know that I've ever quizzed women on this subject, but I've had so many men tell me, and I felt they were honest because I can communicate and talk these things over with men without condemning them. I just I have no right to condemn another man for his problems. Condemnation doesn't belong to me. And I've had them say, well, you can't understand what a comfort it is. I, I get nervous or tense, and, and I just pull out a cigarette, and, and just the whole process of, of pulling out and lighting it and, and, and sucking it, and, and the smoke, said, it, it, it calms me, it, it comforts me. It, uh, I said, oh, do you know God has an answer for that? He said, I will send you another comforter. Your comforter comes 20 to the pack and has to be replaced. His comes in one main package. And you can learn to be comforted with his comfort. 
all the need that causes you to want cigarettes, the Lord can satisfy. I know there's a chemical factor there, and the Lord can cleanse that. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all. But I'm talking about the, the psychological dependence and desires and the need for this, for lust, for drink, for other things. He has an answer for it. I was sharing a little time since I've been on the grounds with a brother who's had an, an, or has an alcohol problem, has had, however you want to define it, recognized himself to be an alcoholic, and he told me that he just has a propensity to that, and therefore the rest of his life, he's going to have to be aware that if he just touches one little bit, right back into it. When I was in prayer this morning, the spirit within me said, Judson, you are a prayeraholic. There is no way you could survive without it. And I know it's true. I am as dependent upon prayer as any alcoholic I have ever met. If I go three consecutive days without prayer, I am physically sick. Four days without prayer, I am flat of my back looking at the ceiling, wondering which doctor to call. And my wife's finally caught on. She simply says, you don't need a doctor, you just need to pray. I can't survive without it. My body is too worn down. My activities are too diverse. I can't live without prayer. But my point is, we can get hold of anything that's contrary to the Word of God and bring it out and let it go to death and be buried without any fear that I'm going to have those longing and cravings and my needs will not be met. He has provided to meet every need of our psychic nature, our physical nature, and our spirit nature. He satisfies man. Amen? If we're willing to bring out to the death and release these. Eight days they cleaned the outer court. Eight days they cleaned the inner court. I said seven a moment ago because I'm sure on the Sabbath day they did not work. But in a total span of 16 days they had refurbished, cleansed, sanctified the entire temple inside and out and it was ready for worship. Vacant 17 to 20 years, cleansed and ready to go in 14 to 16 days. I think sometimes we've done this simple little cop-out that is going to take the rest of my life to really get clean before God, but I'm going to work at it. Hey, it shouldn't take the rest of your life. The Word says, in the day that you seek me with your whole heart, I will be found. I think it may take the rest of our life to make up our mind to do it. But the moment you make up your mind that you will be clean, you will be pure, you will be sanctified, you will be holy, something begins to happen and there comes a strength and an energy and an illumination and a guidance and assistance from others and that life can be cleansed before God and made available for worship in a very short period of time. I've watched God pick up people out of the gutter. I would have said there was no hope. Their mind is gone. Their body is ruined. They're through. Alcohol has destroyed them. I've watched God save them, sober them, heal them, set them in his presence, and give them a ministry in two weeks' time. That's abnormal, but it is not supernatural. How many of you have learned by now that God never does anything supernatural? Never. There is nothing supernatural in the Bible. Everything God does is very natural to him. It's just super to us. God works consistent with his nature, so there's nothing super to it. It'd be kind of nice if the church could stop seeing everything God does as supernatural. God doesn't violate nature. He just lets it flow unrestrained, but his nature, not ours. Okay, cleanse temple. God wants our temples cleansed that we might be able to worship him in purity, in strength, and in truth. Now, was I given till half past? Was that the basic thinking, or was I just uh, given a little liberty? I, I took almost 30 minutes in the singing. I, I would like 15 minutes. May I have 15? If you'll give me 15, I may borrow five, and we'll have it done. <laughs> I think it's only fair to tell you in all honesty, though, that I very rarely pay back what I borrow. I would like to take the next step with you, step four, and I think I can do it at least laid in front of you in just a few minutes. After the temple has been cleansed, there's the need to restore the implements of worship. 
verse 19 says that in the same 16-day period, all the vessels that King Ahaz had cast away have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, here they are. Let's first do a real fast walkthrough and see what he's talking about. Remember that there were stations of worship, five stations of worship, maybe seven if you prefer, five that priests had access to, two that only the high priest had access to. In the outer court, first was the brazen altar, a type of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next was the labor, a type of the word of God. First dealt with blood, the second with water. First with purification, cleansing, the second with sanctification, holiness. In the inner court, was the lampstand, type of, the, of Christ, the lamps and the oil, a type of the Spirit, the illumination of the Spirit through Christ, making worship possible. To the right was the table of showbread, the bread of his presence feasting upon him directly in front of the veil was the golden altar where the incense which spoke of worship responses to the Lord was offered. On the other side of the veil was the Ark of the Covenant and its mercy seat. All right, each of these was a station where worship to God came at a higher level. The first was totally God's provision for sinful man. And then the next was God's provision for a defiled saint. And then it was God's illumination for a saint that desired to worship, God's strength for the saint that chose to worship, and God's position of worship. All right, I'm told in the Word of God, 2 Kings 16, that Ahaz had replaced the brazen altar. He'd go down to Damascus and had seen an ornately carved or cast altar that he thought was so beautiful. He sent the pattern back and said, by the time I get back, I want that in position. They didn't destroy the brazen altar. They just pushed it to the side, replaced it with this fancy idol altar. Now, this is before the house of the Lord was closed up. Would you allow me to suggest that it seems to me that in a lot of today's churches, we have pushed God's provision of salvation to the side, and we have replaced it with something that is very beautiful and fancy, but demonic. It does not provide it. This passage in 2 Kings 16 also tells me that Ahaz offered sacrifices to God on the false altar and then tried to divine, communicate with false gods on the true altar. How mixed up can you get? But I'll tell you this, anytime you try to come up with a plan different than God's, you'll be just that confused. I'm afraid that the cross of Jesus Christ has been set aside and we have tried to bring people through to conversion through many other fancy things. The most common in the circles I have traveled has been emotionalism. Have you been in some of the churches where no matter what was preached, the next thing is every head bowed and every eye closed. We'd like to have it very quiet in the building while the organist is playing just as I am. No vibrato, please. And they set a mood. And then there's that gentle pleading talk of heaven, home, mother, America, and apple pie. Huh? And it begins to move on us. And then the order is raise your hand, stand to your feet, step out of the aisle, come down here. I want to give you a piece of literature. Now go to the side room and we're going to work it all over. Now, I'm being very harsh. I don't mean to be harsh, but I'm trying real hard to help you recognize that that is total soul response, emotional. On the other side of the scale are those whose approach is totally intellectual. And they really get people convinced without ever getting them converted. And one of the curses in our churches is the number of people who have been convinced but not converted. But when the Spirit of the Lord is doing His deep work, it may stir the emotions, it may illuminate the intellect, but it is the Spirit responding to God. And a birth is produced, and a life is changed, and sin is handled. We dare not let the cross of Jesus Christ be replaced with anything that is fancier. 
because no matter how fancy the replacement is, it cannot be the place where God meets the sinner. God said, I want a altar built of brass, these dimensions, and my fire, and you bring the sacrifice I've called for. It may be bloody, it may be gory, it may not be beautiful, but it's God's only provision for sin. We've got to stay with it. The priest got rid of the false and replaced the true. The laver set on a pedestal, lifted up in an exalted position, the focal point after you pass the brazen altar. But Ahaz, according to 2 Kings 16, in need of brass to buy off his enemy, cut the pedestal off and set the laver on the paving stones. He didn't destroy the laver. He just lowered it. You know the laver is a type of the word. We are cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. People are not now destroying the word. They're just putting it down on a humanistic level. It's no longer lifted up, elevated, the divine word of God. But they've put it on the paving stones. It's good literature. It does give us some ancient history, has some fine philosophy, and it's certainly on a level with Shakespeare. I've heard preachers say that. And so we get a little of the word and a little of the paving stones and a little of everything, but the word of God liveth and abideth forever. The Bible is God's word, and we dare not lose that elevated position or there will be no power in that word for us. I haven't time to go any further than that. Let's get down to more nitty-gritties. Let it be said to Ahaz's credit, or at least his fear levels, he never destroyed any of these stations of worship. He did not destroy the brazen altar or the laver. No indication he touched the lampstand or the table of showbread or the golden altar. He, he just They were just a little bit too sacred. That is where God met man. But what he did do was destroy all the implements of worship that made these stations useful. And according to 2 Chronicles 28, 24, when these things were being constructed, these vessels were called tongs, bowls, snuffers, basins, spoons, censers, ashpans. Will you understand that the ministry of the brazen altar was impossible? without the ash pan, without the shovels, without the flesh hooks. It took these implements to function there. The laver would have been defiled instantly without basins. They did not wash in the laver. They dipped water out in a basin. They washed in the basin. That way the word didn't get defiled, but what was in the word cleansed them. So Ahaz broke up and passed out all the basins. How could you keep the lamp going without pitchers of oil? And he destroyed the pitchers. How could you feast at the Lord's table if there were no plates or cups, spoons? He destroyed them. The tongs for bringing in coals for the golden altar were destroyed. He was wise enough not to destroy the stations per se, but to render them useless by destroying all the implements that made it possible to function at these stations. And that is consistent with religion. I want you to notice with me as you reread your Old Testament that God never ever allowed an enemy to come in and strip the temple. The enemy threatened the king who stripped the temple and brought the things out to the enemy. I do not believe that God has authorized Satan to come in and strip the church of anything that he has given to us. But Satan knows enough to threaten our leaders who strip it from us and hand it to the enemy. A second thing you learn from the Old Testament history is that even though the king stripped the house of the Lord on several occasions to buy off an enemy, it never worked. Once the enemy got what he could from you, he came in and captured anyway. All they got was a delay in action. Now, may I become quite specific? I'm convinced, saints, 
that in every move of God, and I have a little knowledge of church history, and I see it happening very rapidly in this move of God, leadership does not destroy the stations of worship. They can make them very sanctimonious and holy. But what they do is systematically get rid of all the vessels that make it possible to respond. One of the earliest vessels, whether you consider tongs, bowls, snuffers, basins, spoons, or whatever, one of the earliest things they strip away from us is the song of the Lord. This move calls it singing in the Spirit. This is not new. Church history will show that there's rarely been an outbreaking of God for what there's been this spontaneous singing under the Lord. To where there's just a release from within us and our spirit sings unto God. And the Holy Spirit within us aids us in that song. You do know that the Bible does not teach that tongues is the point of overflow of the Spirit. It teaches that song is. Be not drunk with wine, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, that's melodious, and hymns, that's melodious, and spiritual songs, that's melodious, singing in your heart unto the Lord, that's melodious, and making melody in your heart to the Lord. All five points of the overflow of the Spirit are melodious, singing unto the Lord. The Holy Spirit is a singing spirit. Have you noted with me that if you can wake up just a little ahead of your alarm, the Spirit's already singing? He probably sang all night long. I have learned that if I'll pay attention to what he's singing, I may get guidance for the day. It's likely he's singing what I'm going to need before the day is over. But here's a whole congregation just singing unto the Lord, singing praises unto the Lord, extemporizing their song unto the Lord, and leadership feels that it's out of hand because it's out of their hand. You can't control it. And so... By various ruses, they get us to stop singing the song of the Lord and start singing page 336. Now, I hope just once before I stop traveling, I'll be in a church where the people are honest enough to stand up and sing 336. 